so I'm delighted that you are all here. Um, you were our first choices to come and talk as we, were, as we were organizing the meeting, our first choices of people to come and consider the uh, future of genome editing. And it's terrific that you, you could all be here. As an organizer, I'm really embarrassed to be giving the, uh, the first talk, this opening talk. Hmm? I was going to say, um, it, it's, it is embarrassing for me, but my defense is that there are three organizers and I was outvoted. <laughs> so, so thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> okay. So I'm, uh, the, the inspiration for my title is actually two edges. One edge is the end of my career. As many of you know, I closed my research lab about a year and a half ago. And I'm, I'm still haunting the halls, but uh, not, not doing research. Uh, and the other edge is the, sort of the edge that Alex Hanold is looking over. You know, it's the view into the uncertain future. Now, uh, Alex, uh, I'm, I'm sure, got to this, this point by climbing a very long vertical wall and he's looking down full of confidence about the next time he has a wall to climb. Um, but there's another approach to, to looking into the future, and that's illustrated by this young man who uh, is taking a more cautious uh, approach and probably isn't quite as optimistic about what he's going to see when he looks over the edge. But uh, we're here today to, to talk about where we are and to look over that edge and see what the future holds. And uh, I'm obviously not going to tell you, but uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to run through a bunch of uh, concerns, some issues that uh, sort of lay the groundwork for a lot of what we're going to talk about in upcoming sessions. So I'm going to start with a timeline of genome modification. And uh, as it says, this is not to scale. I'm just going to hit a few high points. So, Nature has been editing genomes for a really long time by, uh, by amplifying, uh, amplifying genetic uh, features that are adaptive in whatever environment an organism might find itself in. So uh, nature has been editing genomes long before we thought about it at all. Humans became involved with the development of agriculture. Uh, and in, in this situation, uh, people were uh, directing the evolutionary trajectory of genomes by doing selective breeding for traits that were beneficial uh, in, in the, whatever their situation happened to be. The selective breeding became more rational with the discovery of the, uh, the rules and the processes of genetics so that uh, people could look more deeply into, into uh, how to do this selective breeding. But all of these uh, processes were based on natural variations. Whatever happened to be out there, uh, if, you could, if you could corral them and, and bring them together, that was, that was your, your, uh, your library of capabilities. In the first half of the 20th century, H.J. Muller and Charlotte Auerbach showed that you could accelerate the rate of uh, variation. Muller by radi radiation, treating uh, organisms with radiation, and Charlotte Auerbach using chemical mutagens. So things were going faster, but they were still random. And the point I really want to use as a launching point for the rest of my talk is the development of uh, procedures of gene targeting in the late 1970s and uh, into the 1980s. And this uh, happened first in yeast, but I'm going to talk about uh, the procedures that were developed for mammalian cells. So the, the illustration here shows the, the uh, approach that Mario Capecchi's lab took to doing gene targeting, which meant developing in the laboratory a piece of DNA that carried whatever modification you wanted in the target gene. Uh, 
and introducing that into cells and then providing selection for all integration events. There's a neomycin resistance marker here so that all integration events would, be, would have a particular characteristic. <coughs> Pardon me. And then providing a marker that could be selected against. So uh, when this DNA went into the wrong places, you could eliminate cells that carried that. And so this was called positive-negative selection, and it was enormously effective in mice. So thousands of mouse strains carrying different gen uh, targeted genetic modifications have facilitated research in mice uh, over the last two or three decades. The problem was that this wasn't really transportable to other organisms. And one of the reasons for that is that the raw frequency of those targeted integration events was really terrible. One in a million cells might have gotten that uh, integration event. Often it was even less, so the selection had to be very powerful. But it was also true that uh, you needed, in order to make modified mice, you needed to have embryonic stem cells that were very robust so that they could be, they could be modified, the rare, correctly modified cells uh, identified, then expanded, and ultimately injected into um, early mouse embryos uh, so that uh, they would populate the, the cells of the offspring of the, the mother who got, got that embryo, uh, and eventually, after a few generations, generate heterozygotes and homozygotes that could be studied. So this was uh, inefficient, depended on stem cells that most organisms didn't provide, uh, and uh, expensive and time-consuming. At the same time, we were learning from other studies that recombination events like the type that the Capecchi procedure depended on were stimulated in natural situations by double-strand breaks. And so that was true of uh, breaks made by uh, radiation damage led to repair that involved crossing over between sister chromatids. It uh, is the way recombination uh, in meiosis is stimulated in essentially all organisms by making intentional double-strand breaks. Uh, people working on the mating type switching process in yeast showed that it was dependent on a site-specific endonuclease called HO. And based on those observations, people began uh, using some of these site-specific nucleases like HO and ISCE1 to show that if you put a site for those enzymes into a genome that didn't have them, in expressing the enzyme would lead to a double strand break that stimulated recombination and also mutagenesis. And uh, Jim Haber did this with both HO and ISCE1 in yeast. Maria Jason, 25 years ago, uh, began publishing a series of very uh, influential experiments showing that ISCE1 had this effect in mammalian cells. So what we knew at that point was that uh, just hoping wasn't a very efficient way of getting these gene targeting processes to go, but making a double strand break in the target was efficient. So uh, this is not perhaps surprising in retrospect. A double strand break is potentially lethal damage in a cell. One of the repair processes that cells use to repair those breaks is homolo homology dependent repair. Um, so it, it actually was made a certain amount of sense. But what we learned was that um, if we were going to really make gene targeting work effectively, we needed to have a method of making targeted double-strand breaks that was both efficient and flexible so that we could choose the targets. Well, humans are pretty good at making tools uh, by repurposing elements of the world they find around them. Uh, just to keep things light, I uh, wanted to illustrate how rocks and shells and, and uh, hides were repurposed to make early human tools. And these are the tools we have today for genome modifications. Fyodor mentioned uh, the early zinc finger nucleases, uh, the DNA binding domain linked to uh, cleavage domain. Uh, the TAL domains, uh, when they were discovered, uh, were linked to these same nuclease domains. Uh, to direct cleavage, and now, of course, we're working with m largely, though not exclusively, with the CRISPR tools. It, it, with a slightly different format, I want to 
say something about where those tools came from. The zinc fingers that allow site-specific binding of the zinc finger nucleases came initially from studies of eukaryotic transcription factors. There are modules that recognize approximately three bases at a time, and uh, several of them together will recognize longer targets. They're linked to a cleavage domain from a bacterial restriction enzyme, needs to dimerize, but it took studies on eukaryotic transcription and bacterial restriction enzymes to, uh, to lay out the components that are what make up the zinc finger nucleases. The uh, more amenable DNA binding domains in talons came from bacterial proteins that uh, are injected by pathogenic bacteria into the host plant cell to regulate plant genes. So again, uh, transcription factor, it's a bacterial slash eukaryotic transcription factor. And of course, the CRISPR tools came from uh, studies initially of just odd genomic uh, constructions and eventually the identification of uh, these, these elements as a system of bacterial immunity. So none of these uh, tools that we now use and rely on was developed by saying, I'm going to go out there and find a genome editing tool. They all came from just learning how the world works and finding components that could be, uh, could be repurposed in this way. So I think we, we're all familiar with the fact that CRISPR has taken over due to really two major things. One is that there's only a, one constant protein needed. You don't have to re-engineer a protein or two proteins when you're targeting a new, uh, a new sequence. And the simplicity of recognition by Watson Crick Watson Crick base pairing. But even the marvelous CRISPR tools only make a double strand break. Fortunately, it's a targeted double strand break. But everything that happens after that depends on the DNA repair capabilities of the cells in which that break uh, occurred. And as I've been talking about, um, one of the uh, modes of repair is homology dependent <clears throat> and uh, stimulates the type of uh, sequence replacement that uh, Capecchi uh, was working with in mice. And the other process, the other general class of processes, uh, we call non-homologous end joining, and it's sometimes inaccurate. Um, and when it is inaccurate, the cell creates uh, small insertions and deletions, sometimes large insertions and deletions, specifically at the target site, so you, uh, targeted mutations result. And there are two problems with th this scheme uh, as far as most of the goals of editing are concerned. One is that in almost all higher cells, end joining uh, is more efficient than homology-dependent repair, and we have essentially no control over what uh, mutations are made by non-homologous end joining. Nonetheless, uh, lots and lots of organisms have been successfully edited using these tools. And you can see I, I gave up a little while ago uh, trying to keep a list of all the organisms. I think the IGI actually has a, a list on its, on its website. Um, but uh, you, you can sort of look for your favorite organism in the list. There are pathogens, vectors for pathogens, uh, organisms we eat, you know, uh, there's nothing about making a break and having it repaired that's organism-specific. Almost all organisms repair breaks in about the same way. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but we also have seen recently modifications of the basic double-strand break approach uh, to making use of the recognition capabilities of the CRISPR system. And this is just to mention briefly base editing, where the recognition capabilities of the Cas9 protein and the, the guide RNA uh, are made use of to make specific base modifications. Uh, so the Cas9 protein is linked to a deaminase, a cytosine deaminase or an adenosine deaminase uh, in, in another case. And uh, this, this has proved very effective in some circumstances, but I want to point out that in this uh, 
cytosine deaminase in particular, its effectiveness required a deep understanding of how cells repair base mismatches. Because uh, there's one thing that's illustrated here and one that's not. To make this really effective, this version of Cas9 had to cut one strand, but not both. And what's not illustrated is that there's also a linkage, I think, somewhere else on Cas9 to an inhibitor of the natural cellular process of, remem of removing uh, deaminated cytidines, which are actually uridines, in DNA, so that repair would favor the uh, novel sequence. Another example of a, another approach that's appeared recently and generated a lot of, of excitement is called uh, prime editing. And like the previous example, the, this was developed in David Liu's lab at Harvard. And the goal here was to make homology-dependent repair more effective. And again, this required using natural components and understanding natural processes. And so in this case, the template for repair is an RNA extension of the guide RNA. And the enzyme that's going to copy that template is a reverse transcriptase that's tethered to the Cas9 protein. There are other approaches to uh, making homology-dependent repair more effective. Uh, this one's brand new. We'll see how, how it works out. So we've got these powerful tools and variations on them. Let's spend a few minutes looking at some of the applications that have already been made, and we'll hear more about uh, some of these uh, as the, the colloquium goes on. And this is a, uh, an, uh, an application in, in plants. So this group in China, led by Kaisha Gao, wanted to make bread wheat plants that put less of their energy into growing tall and more of their energy into making more kernels, which, of course, the source of the uh, food that we eat. And this is a, a great example of the power of CRISPR because this wheat is, is hexaploid. It has three diploid genomes. And in order to, to knock out this DEP1 gene that uh, has these effects, they had to, they had to knock out by non-homologous end joining all six alleles, and they were able to do this with CRISPR, and you can see uh, kernel weight has gone up and plant height has gone down due to these uh, modifications. This is another uh, example of uh, agricultural genome editing. Uh, people are probably familiar with this. This has been out there for a, for a while. Dairy farmers will dehorn their cattle most dairy cattle have horns. They live in very tight quarters. And if they aren't dehorned, they will gore each other and the farm workers. But nobody likes that. But nobody really likes the dehorning processes either because they're, they're physical. They can be done with saws or uh, cauterization. Or I have a friend who said when he was growing up on a ranch, they did it with ice cream scoops, something that looked like an ice cream scoop to take out the, the horn bud of newborn calves. So it turns out that there are uh, herds of Angus that naturally are hornless due to a, an allele that's called polled. And this group at Recombinetics in Minnesota took the sequence of the polled allele that had been identified in Angus cattle and put it into the Holstein genome. And these two calves were born, these two bullocks, Burry and Spotty Guy. Uh, they're, they're hornless. And their offspring are hornless, too. Um, these, uh, I was up at Davis in July uh, visiting. I think that was when I visited Pam Ronald. But I also went uh, with Alison Van Enenam to look at these uh, second generation uh, hornless uh, bulls. These two are Burry's sons. This is a cousin that shows what they would have looked like had they not been genetically dehorned. So, there are just a couple of examples. There are a lot more examples. I hope Dan Voitas will tell you about uh, some of the ones he's worked on, of which some in this list are. Um, but there are lots of, lots of useful modifications that, are people, that people are making in crop plants and in livestock. So one of the 
questions that has arisen for obvious reasons is how should these organisms be regulated? And I'm delighted that Neil Hoffman is here to tell us a little more about USDA processes. Um, but, you know, there, there really isn't a detectable difference uh, in the genome between plants that were uh, developed by selective breeding and plants that were genome edited in cases where there is no DNA from another species and the modifications are simple uh, mutation of, of natural genes. So um, it seems to a lot of us as if that, you know, if, if you're not going to regulate uh, in, in a complex way plants that arose from heavy-duty chemical mutagenesis or radiation mutagenesis of seed, uh, why would you regulate uh, in, a, in a strict way plants that were generated by, by genome editing? And unfortunately, and the authors of this uh, correspondence uh, to Nature Biotechnology are in the room, um, we were concerned when the uh, EU, through the European uh, uh, Court of Justice, decided that genome edited crops should be regulated in the same high hurdle demanding way that uh, existing GMOs are regulated. And we said that we are gravely concerned for reasons that had not only to do with, you know, the qualities of the plants and what Europeans might eat, but because of the effect that this would have on people in uh, the developing world where many of these agricultural modifications could lead to uh, better nutrition and greater food security uh, because uh, nations in the developing world will follow the lead of uh, the, the developed world. Okay, now let's talk about applications in medicine. And I'm gonna, uh, gonna talk exclusive, almost exclusively about sickle cell disease. So I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with sickle cell disease. Uh, it's due to a single mutation in the uh, gene for the beta chain of hemoglobin. Uh, people who inherit uh, two mutant copies of the gene uh, have uh, symptoms that are due to clogging of the uh, small blood vessels by these sickle-shaped uh, red blood cells, uh, and they suffer from acute and chronic pain uh, and organ damage, and there's, there's, in, there, there's, no, there's no easy treatment for this, no sim good symptomatic treatment. Uh, if things are really bad, they get uh, bone marrow transplants, uh, but it's an obvious target for genetic modification. And there are three styles of modification for sickle cell disease that are uh, in development a uh, couple of them all the way in, into people already. One is to add a good beta globin gene on a lentiviral vector, and this is called lentiglobin uh, by the people who developed it. Another is to induce re-expression of the, the beta-like chain that's normally expressed only in fetal development. And the third, which is lagging a bit behind, is to make a direct correction of the mutation in, uh, in the beta globin gene. And I want to make a couple of distinctions with this slide. One is that all of these therapies are somatic therapies. They're therapies that are directed at people who are already here. Um, and the sickle cell therapies are based on uh, what's referred to as ex vivo manipulations, where cells are taken from a patient, modified, in the laboratory, um, and, and then uh, put back into, infused back into the same patient from which they came. And this works really well for uh, uh, cells, where, for situations where there are stem or precursor cells that can be modified and then used to reconstitute uh, the hematopoietic system. There are also therapies being developed, including for uh, sickle cell disease that are based on in vivo therapies where something has to be delivered 
uh, straight into the body. And I uh, haven't seen Eric Olson yet, but uh, I believe when he's here, he will tell us about a therapy that he's, he's uh, been developing for in vivo delivery. So the, the first two of those sickle cell therapies already have some results to talk about. This is a young woman who appeared on 60 Minutes back in March, and I've given you the uh, URL so you can go watch this uh, segment on, on 60 Minutes. I don't know whether we're planning to publish the slides, but uh, you can ask me for it if, you, if we don't. So J Janelle Stevenson had cells uh, extracted from her bone marrow, treated in, in the laboratory with the lentiviral vector with a good beta globin gene on it. They were, I guess, expanded somewhat. And here they are in a little bag, just about to be reinfused into Janelle. So, and, uh, by the, so that was done in November 2017. By the time uh, the 60 Minutes uh, episode was, was filmed, she was doing quite well. This woman, Victoria Gray, got the second style of uh, therapy. So this is a picture of her. And she's being followed by NPR. And I a couple of links here. Uh, she's packing up after having her treatment and then living in a motel room or whatever in, in Nashville. Is it Nashville? Memphis? Nashville. Um, so she, she could be monitored after the infusion of her, her cells. And in her case, the goal was to re-express the fetal version of uh, the beta chain. So normally during uh, human development, there's an embryonic form uh, called epsilon in the beta family. Then the uh, gamma chains come on. They disappear after birth, and, and beta dominates. But if beta is bad, it had been shown through some natural uh, mutants that re-expression of gamma was very effective. Uh, so that's what ha happened to her. And the procedure was that the protein that silences the gamma genes after birth was uh, prevented from being expressed by knocking out a sequence next to its gene that's required for expression in the hematopoietic lineage. So it, it, when it couldn't be expressed, the gamma genes stayed on. This uh, was done in a similar way to uh, the lentiglobin, except that in this case, uh, it wasn't bone marrow cells, but it was circulating CD34 positive hematopoietic stem and precursor cells that were treated and then reinfused to her, into her after a treatment that got rid of a substantial fraction of the remaining uh, uh, bone marrow cells. So um, that's a little different from what happened with uh, lentiglobin. And in this case, which Fyodor generously led me to, um, she was expressing mostly sickle cell uh, hemoglobin before treatment. She got a a bone marrow, a, sorry, a, uh, an, an infusion of wild-type cells uh, from, from a donor. But then as these disappeared, as the wild-type cells disappeared over time, and she began making these fetal globins, after four months, about half of all of her hemoglobin was fetal hemoglobin. And uh, not only that, but... She, had, she hadn't had any vaso-occlusive crises uh, in those four months, um, and she'd been having seven a year uh, on average before then. So we're getting success stories. The other approach, which I worked on when I was on sabbatical at the IGI five years ago, uh, was to correct the unique mutation that all sickle cell sufferers have. And this was using uh, CRISPR to make a break near the site of this mutation and a donor DNA that would uh, correct the mutation or restore the wild-type sequence. Um, this is still in development. In the early stages, the efficiency of this was terrible. As I told you, the homology-dependent processes are quite inefficient. But the, the uh, efficiency has gone up by dint of effort. Uh, and 
this may soon get to uh, the first human patients. By scanning uh, clinicaltrials.gov on, on the web, Ross Wilson and I came up with a list of clinical trials that are, that are listed there for a variety of different diseases. So there's a lot going on. Uh, for most of these, there aren't, uh, there aren't treated patients to report on, but things are moving fast. But moving apace, perhaps we should say. So what are we concerned about with these somatic treatments? Well, one is that uh, in essentially all cases, the, the efficiency of what we're trying to do is much less than 100%. In some cases, that's quite tolerable. But in other cases, uh, it's a limitation. Mutagenesis through non-homologous end joining is more efficient than uh, sequence replacement. And uh, a lot of the things we'd like to be able to do would depend on sequence replacement, uh, couldn't be accessed th just through mitogenesis. Delivery is a huge problem. With uh, these uh, diseases of circulating cells, we have access to hematopoietic stem cells that can be manipulated ex vivo and restored. But lots of tissues and cell types that we'd like to manipulate don't have stem cells that we know about, and so uh, in vivo approaches are going to have to have to be used. Safety is an issue. The off-target effects, I would say, are not as big an issue as a lot of people think they are. We have kind of a lot of ways to both uh, assess and minimize them, but it does lead us to uh, the questions about a risk-benefit analysis. How severe is the disease? How likely are adverse effects uh, to occur. How do you give truly, in, how do you get truly informed consent from patients who don't have any background in genetics? Um, you know, uh, you can explain it to them until you're blue in the face. What do they get? What conditions are we going to develop therapies for? Are we going to go for common ones? Well, these are these are expensive therapies. Uh, if you go for common ones, the, the aggregate cost is going to be really high. You, if you go for rare ones, the individual cost is likely to be very high. And what are you, what are you trying to do eventually? Are there alternative treatments? I think one of the reasons that Sangamo didn't continue developing the knockout of CCR5 that they began was because uh, the, of the financial considerations. The uh, antiretroviral drugs are already doing a, a very good job, and uh, Sangamo would have to not only go through a long process of demonstrating the efficacy of their, their therapy, but they'd have to compete in the marketplace with the antiretrovirals. Cost, I mentioned before. Will insurance cover these costs? Uh, they've been covering costs of some of the other molecular therapies that have been uh, rolled out, uh, for example, for spinal muscular atrophy, but how long will they continue doing that? Will only the wealthy be able to benefit from, from these uh, treatments? How do we distribute these uh, treatments to the people who need them the most? And there are people in the room who are uh, very interested in this, and we'll have more discussion of it, and how will they be regulated. So let me just drop back one line and talk about distribution. So uh, when I was working on the sickle cell project, I was in Oakland, California, way up here someplace, and, uh, Berkeley. And there are lots of sickle cell sufferers in Oakland and Berkeley. The estimate is there are 100,000 uh, sickle cell sufferers in the US, homozygotes. But the vast majority of people who suffer from sickle cell disease are in tropical regions of Africa and Asia. And there's no conceivable way we could get the current versions of those somatic therapies to those, to those people. So this is a goal. All right, so the somatic therapies are moving along. Everything looks good. Then somebody threw a hand grenade. <laughs> 
This is, you're all aware that just over a year ago, uh, word came out of the CRISPR babies that have been generated by Hu Jiankei in, in China. Uh, the newspapers and the scientific news organizations were full of this. Um, this is a, a couple of shots from the Second International uh, Summit that, uh, uh, that this all happened at. So this was happening in Hong Kong. These are the, the uh, press here in the room. They were shuttled over onto one side of the room, but there were dozens and dozens of them clicking shutters madly and uh, had to be silenced by the, the moderator of the session. And here's He Jiang Kei giving a presentation. Um, this slide is, is particularly interesting, and Kathy Niakan and I were talking about this uh, earlier this morning because it doesn't show what he says it does. Um, so, so germline editing. Turns out that germline editing is much simpler than, at least in, uh, procedurally, than somatic editing. This is a diagram of a normal in vitro fertilization process. The mom is given uh, follicle stimulating hormone to uh, induce superovulation. Those uh, eggs are, re are retrieved from the ovary and put into a culture dish, some vessel. Uh, fertilized with sperm provided by dad, they're allowed to grow for a little while in the laboratory just to make sure that development is going okay, usually up to the blastocyst stage, and then they're implanted back into mom. So that's normal in vitro fertilization used for many years as a fertility treatment. To put editing into the mix, all you really have to do is introduce CRISPR or one of the other uh, reagents into these eggs just after fertilization or, con or concomitant with fertilization. Whatever modifications are going to be made, uh, you can grow the embryos up for a while, uh, do a little uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to make sure that things are going okay. You have limited ability to do that, but you do what you can, and then implant into mom. And this is what J.K. Hu ostensibly did. Um, and it's, as you can see, it's, it's a very simple procedure. And Kathy Neocon is going to talk later about uh, some of the things that are actually happening uh, at this stage. Doing an injection, this is one of Kathy's slides that uh, was borrowed by science a couple of years ago. Um, the human embryo injections are fairly straightforward to do. And even before uh, the J.K. Huh uh, fiasco, People had, knew that this was coming. Uh, there were reports of embryo editing that hadn't uh, led to a, a pregnancy. Um, and so people began uh, s stating a position, stating what they thought uh, ought to happen in, in, these, in, in the case of germline editing. And there's one uh, opinion that was published in 2015 saying take a prudent path forward. It actually said uh, there's uh, no justification for doing it currently, but uh, if you're going to go forward, be real cautious about it. There was another piece that was published uh, just about the same time uh, expressing the opinion of uh, some people we know uh, uh, that the germline should never be edited because there would always be alternatives that were uh, as good and not as dangerous. The National Academies set up a committee to produce a report that came out uh, in 2017 to look into this. And what they did was they said, well, um, if, if this ever comes to pass, it has to have the following characteristics, germline editing in humans. It should be restricted to serious diseases or conditions that have a very clear genetic cause. There are, this would be in situations where there are not good alternatives, and there should be a very thorough risk 
benefit analysis to go with it. And uh, then as, as now, uh, it was difficult to see what, what conditions and uh, what, what conditions, genetic conditions, would be able to meet all, the, all these criteria. The J.K. Hood uh, uh, presentation uh, revealing what he did occasioned a, uh, a call for a, an actual moratorium. A uh, number of people involved in various levels uh, in genome editing signed this, came out uh, early this year in Nature. And uh, the National Academies got involved again along with the Royal Society and put together an international commission that I actually sit on to talk in more detail uh, about the criteria. So uh, you, can't, you probably can't read this, but relative to human clinical use of human germline genome editing, the commission was assigned to identify the scientific issues as well as societal and ethical issues where inextricably linked to research and clinical practice that must be evaluated for various classes of possible applications. So that's what we're doing right now. If you want to weigh in on this, you're welcome to talk to me, send me a, a message or whatever. So um, everybody landed hard on uh, Dr. He for really good reasons. There are many things wrong with the way he, he approached this. Um, for one thing, uh, he was targeting the CCR5 gene to try to protect the children from, uh, a, from uh, HIV infection and ultimately uh, getting AIDS. And this is not the best way to protect someone from HIV. Um, another issue around this with people Aren't, aren't actually focusing on is that it's not clear that a knockout of CCR5 would be, uh, would, that it would be free of adverse effects in a Chinese genetic background. The cases of natural mutations in CCR5 are all in Northern Europeans. And it seems p possible that uh, these, these mutations are somehow protective against some type of infection, maybe similar to uh, the sickle globin protecting it, to some extent against infection with malaria. Um, and that's why the allele frequency is as high as it is, sort of, I think it's sort of one percent uh, amongst northern Europeans. Uh, those genomes may have adapted to the absence or the semi-absence of uh, functional CCR5, whereas mu mutations in CCR5 are, are all but absent in Asian populations, and it's not clear that, the, that a necessary ab adaptation might be there. So there are lots of considerations. That's kind of a you know, it's kind of an intellectual one, um, but lots of things uh, were wrong about what J.K. did. But going forward, there's still a lot of issues, um, and I'm just going highlight, to highlight some of them. So the bottom line is that we don't have good information on the safety and efficacy of doing uh, human embryo manipulations. The editing isn't 100 percent. If it isn't 100 percent, then uh, there are going to be some wild type alleles uh, that are that are uh, in cells of the embryo as it develops, and you won't have achieved uh, achieved the goal. If the if the editing is effective, but it continues beyond the uh, the stage where there are just two genomes in the in the cell. Uh, you may get uh, situations where in the embryo, some cells have one modification, some have another, some have a modification, another doesn't, and you have mosaics, and it's very difficult to predict what the effect will be on uh, mosaic humans that are born after these manipulations. The off-target effects are both more and less serious for, uh, for embryos. <clears throat> 
more serious because any off-target modification that's made is going to uh, have the potential of affecting every stage of development of that person. In somatic treatments, we're looking at one person already grown. Um, you know, if, if a particular uh, secondary target was necessary during embryonic development only, then modifying that target uh, somatically is not going to have an effect. But here, the entire range of uh, human development is at risk. On the, on the plus side, you, there are many, many fewer genomes at risk in the treatment event than is true for somatic uh, treatments. So if you're doing a somatic treatment, you've got a lot of cells that you're treating at the same time. If a very small minority of those cells gets an off-target mutation that somehow makes those cells capable of growing faster, you may, you may have generated cancer cells that in that population can take over once they're put back into the patient. That happened in the early uh, ex-skid trials in London and Paris uh, around the turn of the century. Um, some off-target integrations that were very rare in the population ended up uh, producing a leukemia in some of those patients, a minority of those patients. But uh, if you have a CRISPR tool that has a, close to 100% on-target efficacy and a very low off-target probability, aggregate probability of 1%, even 5%, then almost all of the embryos that are treated will, will have the right on-target and no off-target uh, modifications. On-target modifications are a huge issue, particularly in cases where what you want to do is to uh, have a homology-dependent uh, re restoration event um, because the non-homologous end joining is active in embryos as shown by a number of, uh, different, uh, number of different groups. And there are even very large deletions that occur through non-homologous end joining that are very difficult to prevent. So in some ways, the on-target issues are more substantial than the off-target issues in, in, uh, in embryos. And then, of course, uh, all, all of the changes that are made are potentially passed on to subsequent generations. Uh, uh, so it's not going to have, if that, if that being said, uh, when, when <laughs> trying to choose my words carefully here, um, humans, humans reproduce so slowly that if mod modification is made in one child or a, a few children, passed on to uh, genera subsequent generations, their subsequent generations. It's not, going to, it's not going to be spread to the global human population anytime soon. And so some of the horror scenarios that people have imagined are uh, unrealistic. Speaking of unrealistic horror scenarios, um, I just want to uh, conclude with thinking about uh, how things are different now from uh, how they were in 1975 when the issue was recombinant DNA. So I was at a Silomar. I was very young, uh, but I was there. I actually acted as a scribe for Sidney Brenner. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine. Um, but <laughs> um, but uh, not only was this in a more rustic setting than the... Uh, uh, summits around uh, germline editing uh, that have been held. But uh, at that time, we really didn't know what the capabilities and the, the potential threats of recombinant DNA were. And so people were imagining a lot of terrible scenarios where a laboratory bacterium got loose in the sewer system and uh, was a superbug and killed everybody. So um, since I have a couple minutes, I'm going to just elaborate on that a bit. Almost everybody at uh, Asilomar was a 
molecular geneticist, a molecular biologist. There was a very small number of real microbiologists. And uh, two of them made uh, presentations at the meeting. They were ultimately published in Nature uh, later, later in 1975. And both of them had overseen the following experiment. They grew up strains of E. coli, uh, pelleted the cells, stirred them into a glass of milk, and had somebody drink it. One of these guys did it to himself. Kudos to him. The other, as far as I can tell, used graduate students. <laughs> Not a surprise, right? <laughs> um, but then what they did was they monitored the stools of these people over a period of time because the laboratory bacteria were somehow marked either with a resistance marker or a, uh, uh, an epitope that could be identified with an antibody. And what they saw in, in all cases was that the marked bacteria could be, could be identified in the stools for the first few days after ingestion but were gone uh, with, within a week or less. And what the, these guys were saying to us, uh, this being 1975, was, I don't know what you're smoking, but uh, you guys can't accidentally create a dangerous pathogen out of a wimpy laboratory strain. So today, we're not in that situation. We have a much clearer idea of what we can do and what we might do wrong with the tools that we have, that we have now. The future for recombinant DNA turned out to be very bright, supported research, supported uh, medical and agricultural applications um, without any of the horror scenarios coming to pass. Uh, today, um, we have a little bit easier time projecting at least a little way into the future uh, what will happen. So will we, will we in the near future uh, enter the Elysian fields the uh, final resting place of the heroic and the virtuous? Or will we uh, lead ourselves into a Boschian version of hell uh, full of eternal pain and suffering? Well, my crystal ball is very cloudy. Uh, hope some of you will be able to see a little deeper into the future than I can. But I'm really looking forward to the rest of what's going to go on over today and tomorrow. And uh, thanks very much.